Right, welcome, um, Dr. Senef, Dr. Stephanie Senef, um, in in Boston, I believe. I yes, uh, um, snowy Boston. <laughs> We've had a lot of snow, snow lately, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to be um, on this interview at uh, Vitalstoff blog. Uh, readers and the audience of my blog know that this is the place where we'll, they will get information on. Uh, holistic medicine uh, on health and well-being basically and we are uh, we're scheduled to have a talk about uh, issues which are uh, at your heart um, you are one of the world leading scientists um, uh, in the field of assessing um, possible and probable uh, risks of um, a substance which is called glyphosate mm -hmm. um, uh, so maybe Stephanie, uh, if you allow, would you would you like to uh, give us a short introduction of uh, of what your background is and and mm -hmm. uh, what you've been working on so far? Uh, yes. So I have degrees. All of my degrees are from MIT uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I have an undergraduate degree in biology, and then master's, EE, and PhD degrees in computer science and electrical engineering. And I, I've worked uh, really most of my adult life at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT, where I am now a senior research scientist, which is the highest rank on the research staff. Um, so, I've, and so my work was, for many, many years, my work involved developing um, systems for the computer to interact with humans using natural speech and precursors to things like Siri and Amazon Echo, if you know those products. But um, that, that field finally matured, and actually I was happy to move on to something else because it went out into the companies, and, you know, um, they didn't really need me anymore in that field. But it was at about 10 years ago that I got concerned about the autism epidemic in America. I could see that the rates were going up exponentially. And I know that exponential growth gets out of hand quickly once the numbers start to get big, which is what is happening right now. Right now, the autism rate in the United States, the latest estimate, is one in 36 uh, children, which I find terrifying. And um, the government uh, likes to pretend that we're just diagnosing it more. It used to be one in 10,000. So, you know, we're really diagnosing it a lot more. We have a third of them that are nonverbal. It's something we would have noticed, a nonverbal verbal child back then. There's no question in my mind that it's a real epidemic. And it's also the, the trend is exactly matched to the increase that we're seeing in Alzheimer's in the elderly. That's another shocking thing in our country. We now have, I heard, and I almost can't believe this statistic, so I, I might have it wrong. I heard that over, if you're over 75 years old in, in America, you have a one in three chance of having dementia already. And it might have been a one in three chance of eventually developing it. So I'm not sure about which one it is, but either way, it's terrifying. You know, once you reach the age of 75, one in three chance of having dementia. And dementia, I think, and autism are often, are, have many parallels. I think they have a lot in common. I think they're both caused. The epidemic in both cases is caused by glyphosate. I almost have no doubt at this point. The, um, you, you wouldn't know this, but um, um, your predecessor uh, in the last interview we've uh, had on this site was Dr. Dale Bredesen. Um, who has just um, uh, published his book, uh, The End of Alzheimer's. And, mm. and, and he has been um, explaining about um, just that, what you've uh, just referred to. And, and uh, it is it is a very, very um, frightening. But then on the other hand, um, there is uh, a lot we can do about it. And, and the, it all starts with understanding the science uh, behind it. And I'm not a scientist, um, um, uh, but my understanding is that it all starts with the gut, doesn't it? It certainly does. And that's certainly where I was with autism when it's quite interesting because I started studying autism and I was reading all the papers I could find about autism. Um, I have a computer science background, so I was actually using the computer to help me sort of organize information and find, you know, which which things are likely. Looking at all the toxic chemicals, the aluminum, the lead, the mercury, um, the fluoride, all these different things that are in their environment, the vaccines. Um, and I, I had been doing that for about five years. This was 10 years ago, so up till five years ago. And I was frustrated because I could see it was pointing to the gut. I could see the autistic kids had a lot of issues with their gut. And I was aware of Andrew Wakefield's work where he had shown the MMR vaccine in the UK. And of course, that was also a big um, nightmare in terms of the response that he got from the government. Um, but the, um, 
the gut issue was something I didn't understand. I was thinking maybe too many antibiotics, you know, maybe um, taking Tylenol. I was struggling. I was like, it, none of it adds up. It's not enough to explain why we had this epidemic. And at that point, serendipitous, totally serendipitous, was that I had, I went to a conference in Indi- Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, and happened to be that Don Huber was there. He was someone I didn't know. Professor Don Huber, retired professor from Purdue, he's 80 years old, and he's still very active. He's going around the world giving talks about glyphosate, and he gave a two-hour presentation at this conference. I didn't know what glyphosate was, to be honest with you, when I walked into that room, and I sat there for two hours at the edge of my seat because when I finished that two-hour lecture, I knew I had the answer for autism. I was extremely confident that this was the answer, glyphosate, and the thing is, glyphosate is pervasive in our environment. It's the most used chemical by far. in the United States, the United States is the biggest consumer of glyphosate per, per you know population, and it's all over the food supply. It's in the Oreo cookies, it's in the uh, non-GMO Cheerios, you know, all these products that children love. Um, the little goldfish crackers, they all have glyphosate in them. The bread, um, the sugar, the fats, the the, the all the um, canola oil and the, and the corn oil and the soybean oil, those are all called genetically modified Roundup Ready crops. So you get all the sugars and all the oils, and the sugars and the oils go into the processed food industry. And so the glyphosate is all over the processed food industry, foods. Uh, The wheat is sprayed right before the harvest. It's not GMO Roundup Ready, but it's sprayed before the harvest. So are the legumes, for example, the, the lentils, the peas, the chickpeas, the garbanzo beans. They're loaded with glyphosate. So you've basically got it all over the food supply, and the children are eating the processed foods, which are also depleted in nutrients, depleted in minerals, so they've got both nutritional deficiencies on top of poison, exposure to poison in every meal, and that poison is glyphosate. And I have uh, really finally figured out the what I believe is the specific, unusual, and exotic toxic mechanism by which glyphosate could cause a huge list of diseases, not just Alzheimer's and autism, but also all kinds of gut issues, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, all kinds of autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis, um, cancers, several cancers, pancreatic cancer, thyroid cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, liver cancer. These things are all going up dramatically uh, in our population today. The United States is in a complete health care crisis because so many people are so sick. They can't afford the cost of the health care insurance because the insurance rates are skyrocketing because we have so many sick people. And the medical professionals are getting very, very rich because they're treating all these people and they don't know how to treat them. There's many, many people who are going to uh, alternative medicine solutions because the mainstream has completely given up on them. It's just really sad. They're getting these diseases that we never saw before, you know, like eosinophilic esophagitis. It was something that didn't exist until glyphosate became a part of the food supply. And I think it's um, a very interesting, exotic, insidious, cumulative mechanism of toxicity that makes it very difficult to connect the dots because you're getting a slow poison over time that eventually causes some kind of a crisis in your health. And those that crisis could be many different things because it depends on where the glyphosate goes and which, you know, which tissues it affects. It's very uh, complex. And which what your microbiome looks like, you know, depending upon your microbiome, different things happen. It's a very, very complicated, um, but it's remarkable. It's really remarkable and really terrifying. The United States government doesn't even bother to test glyphosate levels in foods. Um, there's a Canadian activist, uh, Tony Mitra, who's a friend of mine, and he finally got, after many years of working, he got the Canadian government to test over 8,000 samples of different foods, both Canadian foods, Canadian imports from the U.S., imports from Europe, imports from Mexico, and he wrote a book called Poison Foods of North America, which he's just recently published, and he has a lot of data in there about the different results that the Canadian government found. And it's very disturbing because the United States and Canada are really standing out as having very high levels compared to Europe and Mexico. So Mexico comes out really very similar to Europe, interestingly enough, much safer food. You guys are doing much better than we are as far as poisoning your population. Right. Um, Maybe um, let's um, begin with the um, actual um, event which led to us linking up, uh, and that is a, a, a request and offer by a leading German newspaper. Um, yes. We won't give the name here because that's not really uh, um, important. What is important is that eventually this newspaper, after having already 
agree to and edited your work on glyphosate has um, um, has uh, uh, re um, uh, re uh, revoked um, its uh, its intent to publish your view on on this. Uh, due to the fact what they said that you were not an expert in uh, the area of uh, glyphosate research um, and that glyphosate as such was considered as safe, um, one of the safest um, um, uh, chemicals uh, for agricultural use. That was the, um, or that is the story. So maybe we can start by you explaining this other view. Why people, or why does the industry and the politicians, uh, why do they believe uh, glyphosate is safe when in fact um, all things are showing that it might not even be um, safe? No, I know. It's a, it has a, as I said, it has a very insidious cumulative mechanism of toxicity, which people don't appreciate. And I think that the Monsanto executives, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think they know this. I think they know that glyphosate has this mechanism of toxicity that I'm referring to, which I'm going to tell you what it is right now. It, it is a glycine molecule. Glycine is an amino acid. The amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So the, all the proteins in the body are made out of beads on a string, sequences of amino acids. There's about 20 of them that are coding amino acids. Glycine is a really, really important one. It's the smallest. It has no side change. It's the smallest amino acid. Glyphosate is a complete glycine molecule, except that it has a replace, it's replaced a hydrogen, which usually attaches to the nitrogen. It's replaced it with another thing, which is called a methylphosphonyl group. So it's got some extra stuff stuck onto its nitrogen atom. And so that is a modified glycine molecule. But the glycine piece of it is exactly the same shape as glycine itself because it is glycine. And what is happening, I believe, I'm almost certain at this point, is that when the uh, amino acids are being assembled, according to the DNA code, the four-letter code of the DNA, when you see the code for glycine and you've got the machinery that's going to match the glycine shape, it finds this glycine molecule and gr grabs it but it has extra stuff sticking out attached to that nitrogen, which it doesn't notice. And therefore it puts that glyphosate molecule in, directly into the protein chain in place of glycine. And if it does this for certain proteins, it's devastating. Sometimes you could get by with it. It wouldn't really, you know, it's not an important part of that protein, but you can find in the research literature, and I've been rummaging through it, I still find new ones every day. You can find specific proteins, specific residues within those proteins that absolutely have to be glycine. And they've done experiments where they replace the glycine with something else, even replacing it with alanine, which is almost, which is the closest amino acid to glycine. It just has one extra methyl group. If you swap out glycine, put in alanine, in some cases, you completely destroy that protein's ability to do its work. For example, myosin. I mean, a good example is myosin, which is the most pro common muscle protein. In the muscles, that's the most common protein, myosin. Myosin has a glycine at position 699 in the chain, 699. If that glycine is swapped out for alanine, then the myosin can only contract at 1% of its capacity to contract. It gets down to only 1%. So it basically ruins the molecule. It cannot do its job. And we have an epidemic in chronic fatigue syndrome in our country, which is some new disease that we didn't used to have where the person is physically exhausted. They're just Their muscles just cannot work. And I think it's due to this glyphosate substituting for glycine in myosin. Myosin is also very important in the gut for peristalsis for the for the to move the feast, you know, the fecal matter through the gut. You you need these these um, contractive proteins, you need myosin. So you could disrupt the uh, gut's ability to uh, to work properly by sort of paralyzing the gut by virtue of throwing glyphosate into various myosin molecules, ran helter-skelter, randomly throwing it into various myosin molecules, messing them up and disturbing uh, the protein's ability to do their work. So there's many, many, many other proteins that have essential glycines in them. One of them is the actual amyloid beta plaque that's in Alzheimer's disease. And they have, researchers have really studied hard with amyloid beta plaque to understand what's going on with it. It's a very difficult topic to understand and they're finally realizing that the toxic form of the molecule is a form that is soluble it's actually sitting inside the the cytoplasm of the cell 
instead of it being in the membrane. The normal protein would be a transmembrane protein goes through the membrane, and it depends upon two essential glycine. Actually, it's more than two. I think it's one, two, four essential glycine residues equally spaced along that molecule to create this structural form, the way the protein folds to form what's called an alpha helix. And the alpha helix goes through the membrane almost like a screw. It goes into the membrane. If you replace those glycines with something else, it messes up its ability to form the alpha helix. And instead it forms, it, it folds as a beta sheet. It's called a beta sheet. And the beta sheet becomes a soluble protein. And then the beta sheets will actually stick together with the help of aluminum atoms. So the aluminum atoms will bind to two of these proteins, stick them together, and form this sort of oligomer. Um, multiple instances of that protein in the cytoplasm of the cell in a soluble form. That is the toxic form of amyloid beta. And they have zeroed in on those glycines as being the problem. But they don't, but those glycines have been there forever. It's highly conserved. All of a sudden, they've become a problem. That's because they're not glycine, they're glyphosate. Once you replace the glyphosate, you have a negative charge. The negative charge attracts the aluminum, and you tie those two proteins together with a glyphosate aluminum complex, and you create this nasty form of that protein that's causing the, the uh, neuron to die. So, I mean, that's just a beautiful story. They've got the whole story in place, except that they're missing the glyphosate part of it. The researchers have figured all this out without realizing that it's the glyphosate that's causing this misfolding of that protein. Right, so this, is, this has been uh, a very intense part of science, um, and we have already um, spoken about that you are, um, you are carrying um, a, um, a degree in biology from MIT, so you mm -hmm. are clearly knowing what you're talking about. Um, but we have to... Um, we have to um, uh, um, admit that it is a theory um, yes, it so is a theory. far. Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the reason why this is not being pursued um, on the part of uh, the scientific um, establishment or on, 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 on the part of uh, the regulators? What, what are the reasons why this has not been um, uh, tested? I mean, it amazes me, actually, because I would have thought that this would be something that chemists would be very, very interested in doing. Uh, I've thought about exactly how you would do it, and I, and in fact, I've discovered it. So Anthony Samsel has been working with me, and we've published several papers together. There is a way to test it, which Monsanto's researchers have already done. And Anthony has the paper in which they did this experiment, and it's quite remarkable. We, we wrote about it in one of our papers that we published recently, our glyphosate six, we have a series of glyphosate one through glyphosate six. And in glyphosate six, he wrote a paragraph in that paper that describes a paper that he acquired. It's an unpublished study done by Monsanto researchers in 1989. And he acquired it from the EPA after much uh, effort. Um, they gave it to him and made him sign a document that said he would not share it with anybody. He could talk about it, but he could not show anybody else the paper. So he has only his eyes have seen it because I don't know of anybody else who has actually gotten that paper from the EPA. I mean, from, yeah, from the EPA. It's a Monsanto document. So this document, it was a research study that was done on um, a type of fish. It's a uh, bluegill sunfish, bluegill sunfish. They exposed them to radio labeled glyphosate. They have a carbon-14 uh, inside the glyphosate so you can track it with a radio label. And then they took, and once they exposed them to the glyphosate, then they took tissue samples from the fish, and they measured the amount of radio label in the tissue samples. And they found that, then they measured glyphosate, and you have a standard way to measure glyphosate, or they had a standard way. I'm not sure which one they used, but there's various ways you can do it, Eliza, you know, for example. Um, they measured glyphosate. They only found 17% of the radio label. Now, they don't think, glyphosate is quite inert. It's very difficult to break it down. There's a few microbes that can do it. Human cells cannot break it down. So um, they didn't understand why there was only 17% of the radio label, uh, whereas there's, you know, there should, have been, there should have been more. So then what they did was they had the idea of uh, uh, applying an enzyme that breaks down proteins. They applied this enzyme. It was a pro proteinase, uh, proteinase, a or something like that, proteinase K, I forget exactly. They applied a specific enzyme that breaks down proteins into individual amino acids. And after they applied that enzyme, they got up to something like 
of the of the radio label was recovered as glyphosate. So in other words, there was this between the 17% and 57% is a a pile of glyphosate that they couldn't see because it was attached to the protein. It was embedded in the protein. They even used the term that it was, um, I'm trying to remember exactly the term they used, but it was like that it was embedded in the protein. It was very specific as if they were admitting that in fact the glyphosate is acting as a glycine analog, which they know it does, by the way. They, they talk about its mechanism of toxicity being that it acts as a glycine analog, but they think of it in terms of glycine has other roles besides going into proteins. It can excite, you know, it's, it's actually a, a, a neuro excitatory uh, amino acid, so it can stimulate neurons uh, to fire and things like that. It has other, other roles that it plays. It's a precursor for methyl groups, for example. It's a precursor for hemoglobin and, and chlorophyll. So it actually glyphosate disrupts the synthesis of hemoglobin and chlorophyll. And people have suggested that it's uh, disruption of chlorophyll is part of its toxicity to plants. So it acts as a glycine analog, but they have refused to admit that in acting as a glycine analog, it could also go into the proteins in, by mistake in place of glycine. It, to me, this, um, this study that they did on these sunfish was almost conclusive evidence that that is happening, in my opinion. So other people could do a similar study. It doesn't sound too hard to me if you were a chemist and you had a lab. It would seem that you could do it. But I think probably people are terrified to face Monsanto. That would be my guess. That there's so far no one out there who has the courage to face Monsanto with this. Or they've been so well trained in chemistry that this is impossible. They, they simply believe it. Because that's another thing that I almost feel like... What, the only way I can explain what's happening is to think that the Monsanto folks know this is happening and then they understand that they need to make sure the chemists are all taught that it can't happen in order to prevent people from even considering it something like that is all i can think that people think it's so unlikely that it could happen that i won't look you know but it's amazing because in fact even the protein that it disrupts in the shikimate pathway which is epsp synthase that protein has an essential glycine residue exactly at the place where glyphosate disrupts it. And they have found multiple species of plants. Monsanto has, well, it's just happened. Multiple species of plants, papers are written about this, and multiple species of microbes have independently discovered that if they get rid of that glycine and change it into alanine, actually change the DNA code of that protein to put alanine there instead of glycine, then they become protected against glyphosate. They become completely insensitive to glyphosate at any level of, of of exposure. It's really quite remar remarkable. There's a beautiful study on E. coli bacteria that had that glycine was replaced by alanine at the active site where the PEP binds. That's the place where glyphosate disrupts the protein. That is the protein that it disrupts. It disrupts the shikimate pathway, which is the pathway that Monsanto, Monsanto says is the mechanism of toxicity of glyphosate. All of that goes right back to that glycine at that location. Replace it with glyphosate. You ruin the protein. The PEP cannot fit and the protein doesn't work and you break the shikimate pathway. So to me, that's the obvious way to explain uh, how it's doing that. But the papers do not say that it's doing that. In other words, no one is, a, is willing to suggest that it could be getting into proteins in place of glycine. Absolutely amazing to me. And yet there's multiple other toxins. There's actually naturally produced toxins. One of them is glufosinate, which is another herbicide. There's several naturally produced toxins that are produced by organisms uh, that work by substituting for amino acids during protein synthesis. That is a well-known mechanism of toxicity that exists in the world already. Glyphosate is a synthetic molecule. Nothing, uh, no biology system makes it. But it could behave exactly the same way as these other known toxins do by displacing glycine during protein synthesis. So to me, you know, there's just so much evidence from every direction that this is happening that I'm just absolutely baffled as to how they have been so successful in, in shutting down this idea and making sure that nobody believes it. It's really quite remarkable what's, going, what's happening to me. Right. We have to, I think we, we have to give our audience a little bit of background into the ways how this um, can, can, can work. And of course it is. You, you mentioned uh, that it is a synthetic um, um, substance. Uh, it has to be synthetic, so it has to be man-made to, um, to own it um, and mm -hmm. to be able right. to, 
to sell it uh, exclusively and when you're able to selling something exclusively uh, which uh, you say is uh, is harm uh, is harmless so it's, it has no harm no risk for humans um, then you uh, you will build um, a huge huge uh, economic power uh, you will have huge um, profit and uh, some of this profit you will of course uh, use to um, to uh, a lobby um, on your behalf uh, with right. regulators and with um, politicians and even with the science community, which is, of course, at least in Germany or in Europe, uh, is very much dependent on public funding, much more right. so than in the US, where there are uh, huge independent right. institutions. So this is uh, one way uh, of um, right. of controlling uh, the discussion about this. And you are, um, with your colleague, you're, you're um, um, one of the few people um, who speak out about this and who um, who point uh, who pinpoint uh, the possible risk? Uh, I would like to um, to um, to open this window because glyphosate is a huge huge issue in Europe. Um, yes. It has been so because it was connected to the GMO um, uh, discussion. Of course, Europe is um, so far um, is quite restrictive on GMOs. Um, mm -hmm. But glyphosate has, of course, then become independent from the GN, from the narrow um, field of using it with GMO crops, um, mm -hmm. but by using it in co conventional agriculture as well. And and this has been happening over here as well. So the mm -hmm. discussion over the last uh, fall has been um, to whether or not renew the license to use glyphosate in the European Union. And this discussion has sent us has centered almost exclusive, exclusively on the question of uh, carcinogenity, so whether or not right. glyphosate does cause cancer and cancer being the ultimate illness. And and, and your your um, point uh, has been um, it, it is not very um, uh, sensible to to focus on whether or not it is um, it does cause cancer, and, and the science community there as well is doubtful. Some of them are saying it is causing cancer. Some say it's not proven. So therefore, the politicians say, okay, we can then renew this license. It is um, okay to renew this license. But right. if, if glyphosate is much more problematic um, below the level of um, causing cancer or not in, in some illnesses which may eventually through um, um, through for example inflammatory processes which uh, right. which they uh, trigger uh, lead to cancer in, in in the long run but in the medium and short term they they cause much much more serious harm uh, because it is um, uh, as, as you mentioned those illnesses which which are below the radar of just being as terrible as cancer. It's, 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 it's a very weird discussion, isn't it? It is. And in fact, I don't think autism is less is terrible than cancer. Autism ruins a child's life and then it ruins the family's life too because the parent becomes, you know, that's their full-time job is taking care of that autistic child for as long as the parent lives. And once the parent dies, the autistic child goes into some institution and just gets basically abandoned. I mean, we're facing a crisis already in this country because the first wave of autistic kids are growing up. And we have programs that sort of help to support, you know, the child. But once you reach 18, you're on your own, you know, and the, the parents are really struggling with um, how to deal with their adult autistic kids, which is going to get much worse every year going forward, you know, because we're getting that first wave growing up. And meanwhile, we've got one in 36 feeding the pipe uh, at the bottom of the young kids. It's just going to be a completely overwhelming. I think that. Uh, in the United States, in not too, not too distant future, we're pretty much going to be consumed by the uh, anyone who's well enough to take care of people is going to spend full time taking care of elderly people with Alzheimer's and children with autism. It's just going to be a full time job for everybody, and there's not going to be much else that we can do. That's where it looks like we're headed, you know, if we just continue along this path, because the rates are continuing to go up exponentially um, without any. Um, concern on the part of the government. The government doesn't even talk about it. It's like it's like it's not happening. It's extremely strange, and um, you know the gut problems are very clear. And the studies have shown that glyphosate disrupts the gut microbes, and particularly disrupts bifidobacteria, which are the ones that are sh shown to be uh, deficient in association with autism. There's just a huge list of 
pairings between what glyphosate does and what autism is that match the manganese deficiency because glyphosate is chelated in the manganese. You know, it's um, the uh, insufficient bile acids, insufficient production of acetate and butyrate. I mean, there's just all these different things that we're seeing in studies of glyphosate and we're seeing in mouse models of autism, actually, there's a very interesting mouse model of autism that was obtained by running um, lab mice through multiple generations. So they simply fed these lab mice the, the food that's contaminated with glyphosate. And Anthony has tested the rat feed, you know, the feed that they give to rodents, and it's, it tests high with glyphosate contamination. No, no surprise there because it's derived from these GMO Roundup Ready crops. So the mice are being poisoned with glyphosate through multiple generations, and the progeny are showing up with ex with mouse equivalents of autism. These mice have autism. They're called BTBR mice, fascinating mice. And, um, you, and they've looked then at their gut, and they've described the exact um, defects in their gut in terms of which microbes are, are underrepresented, which ones are overrepresented, and which problems they have with the gut, the inflammatory gut, the leaky gut, all these different things that these mice have which the autistic kids also have, but which you also see in response to glyphosate. So it's, it's like incredibly obvious to me that glyphosate is the reason why we have the autism epidemic. It is so beautiful, the science. And yet, you know, people say, well, glyphosate must be safe because the government wouldn't let this happen. It's just like a level of disbelief that most people have that they just can, it's just a complete block in terms of it's so interesting how if you've been led to believe for many years um, that something is true, that you are very, very unwilling to admit that it's not true at that point. You've been so brainwashed into thinking that it's true. And, of course, it's subtle. You eat the food, you don't get a bellyache. You know, you don't really notice that you're being poisoned because it's subtle. And that's the crucial issue with it. The glyphosate is getting into the wheat. You know, we have right now an epidemic. You cannot believe the number of children it's so sad in the school system, not even the autistic kids, but you go to school and several of the children have EpiPens ready in case they have an emergency. You know, they eat some, they get exposed to a little bit of peanut butter and then they, they die because of an uh, allergic reaction to peanut butter. We have, you know, gluten intolerance, casein intolerance, kids that can't drink milk, kids that can't eat wheat, kids that can't eat peanuts. You know, we've got all these issues in the school. They won't even let them bring cupcakes to school for their birthday anymore because there's so many kids that can't eat cupcakes. It's just ridiculous. And this is because the glyphosate is getting into the protein, for example, the gluten and the casein. It's getting embedded in the protein, making that protein hard to break down, because that's one thing glyphosate will do once it's in there. It makes it very difficult to break it apart. And also, it gets into the actual digestive enzymes. Anthony tested. He ordered porcine, trypsin, pepsin, and lipase. These are digestive enzymes that are produced by the pancreas. He ordered them from a lab. He tested them, and all three of them tested high for glyphosate contamination. And people are taking these trypsin, you know, they're taking trypsin as a supplement. They're taking glyphosate when they're taking trypsin as a supplement. But your own trypsin is also contaminated with glyphosate, and that's preventing it from doing its job because trypsin has four different regions that have are glycine rich, that have different roles to play in that protein. Any one of those regions, if there's a glyphosate substitution, is going to cause trouble. So trypsin can't digest protein. And protein has glyphosate embedded in it, which makes it, first of all, hard to be broken down, but secondly, more allergenic, more foreign to the immune cells. And then glyphosate also sets up a leaky gut. There's a paper that was written um, recently showing how glyphosate sets up a leaky gut, gut barrier. So you have a leaky gut barrier. You have proteins that can't be digested. They get into the general circulation. The immune cells react to them to form antibodies. And then through a process called molecular mimicry, that becomes autoantibodies attacking your own tissues. So we have a whole bunch of different diseases, autoimmune attack on different tissues, including our collagen, which is loaded with glycine. So the collagen is getting substituted. And, you know, we have uh, autoimmune reactions to the thyroid, um, just all kinds of problems to the folate receptors. All these problems that are showing up are connected to, and then of course you have the myelin sheath, which is what I think is happening with autism autoimmune reaction to the myelin sheath due to molecular mimicry in the brain, which is messing up the, the neuron. So it's just a, a nightmare. Multiple sclerosis is another one that is a myelin sheath attack because of autoimmune. So we have all these proteins that are causing our immune system to develop antibodies 
that are then becoming autoantibodies and attacking our own tissues. That's why we have all these epidemic and, ep and autoimmune diseases as a consequence. Dr. Stephen Gundry, whom you know, um, of course, um, he has also been on this uh, on this program um, uh, on his um, book, uh, Plan The Plant Paradox, and he calls glyphosate one of the seven deadly disruptors um, uh, in terms of uh, enhancing the the problems which lectins cause as such. Right. And, and so uh, the audience is, of course, uh, familiar uh, with the general uh, problem. Stephanie, What is there um, the listener and, and, and the audience can do about um, protecting themselves from glyphosate in the short term? So um, pressing for political um, uh, measures um, to, to ban glyphosate is, is one thing, but um, uh, in the meantime, what, what can one do? What is possible? Right. And so in the United States, we actually have exponential growth right now in uh, the availability of organic food. We're having to import a lot of it because our farmers can't keep up with the demand. But it's very exciting that I think more and more people are waking up. People are finding that when they switch to an organic diet, they, they heal. A lot of people are sick and then they're frustrated and they find that if they just start buying certified organic food, then they start to heal. And so more and more people are doing that. And we're seeing a, a tremendous growth in the grocery stores. When we go to the store, you can see every day, it's really exciting. More products are available. Uh, my husband and I, when we go shopping, we never buy anything if it's not labeled certified organic. We're very, even our spices and our alcohol, our beer and our wines, very hard to find certified organic beer. And I think you may know there was a test done in Germany on the beers, uh, various German beers, and all of them came out positive for glyphosate. So that's one to worry about. Um, you can so eating certified organic is huge. Um, I also recommend eating fermented foods because your your gut microbiome is pretty much shot to hell by glyphosate. It's pretty much destroyed. So eating fermented foods can help to renew it. So um, you know yogurt and um, kimchi and uh, sauerkraut and and apple cider vinegar. We like to use uh, Bragg's organic apple cider vinegar to make make your own salad dressing um, because uh, actually those. Apple cider vinegar in particular and the fermented foods have a, a, a bacterium called acetobacter, which is among the very few microbes that can actually break glyphosate down. Acetobacter can turn glyphosate into useful resources for its own nutrition. It can break it down completely, which is really awesome. There are very few microbes that can do that. Glyphosate has what's called a CP bond, um, carbon phosphorus bond that's quite difficult to break down. Most species don't know how to do that, but acetobacter can. So that's a good reason to get that, to, uh, to eat that. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, ah, I, right. <laughs> I, I, I have muted my line. What is your opinion on, um, um, on stuff like bentonite? Yes, bentonite clay and also organic matter from the soil, fulvic acid and humic acid. There was a study done on cows actually in Europe. I think uh, Monica Cruz, uh, Monica Kruger, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> Kruger. Dr. Kruger uh, did a study with others on cows with, that had been exposed to glyphosate. They saw that they had glyphosate in the urine and they fed them bentonite clay, sauerkraut juice, um, fulvic acid, humic acid, and they, and they noted that the cow's health improved and that the glyphosate levels in the urine went down. So that's a really nice study. And there's some people who are offering products. I don't know. I can't vouch for them, but they are... Um, These are coming out, one called Biome Medic, which has these, these things. Also the minerals, of course, mineral supplements is important. We use um, a Mediterranean sea salts uh, instead of regular sodium chloride table salt. It's important to switch to a natural sea salt where you don't just get sodium and chloride in your salt. You get all these uh, micronutrients because the minerals are really, really clobbered by glyphosate. Not just that they're bound to glyphosate so they're not available, but also the glyphosate disrupts The proteins that are involved in mineral transport and mineral uptake, it's all a mess as far as um, minerals are concerned. And so you, they end up being both toxic and deficient at the same time. I think manganese, iron, copper are all in that class, both toxic and deficient simultaneously in the same person because of glyphosate, because it just totally messes up the body's natural mechanisms of transport. So, um, so mineral supplements... Um, Soaking in Epsom salt baths is something I recommend. And in general, eating sulfur-containing foods. I have found that glyphosate is an absolute train wreck for sulfur. 
um, and particular, particularly sulfate. And I've written a lot about sulfate deficiency, which is a, uh, a major factor in autism as well and probably Alzheimer's disease. Autistic kids have um, reduced amount of heparin sulfate in the ventricles in their brain. Um, a deficiency in heparin sulfate. And heparin sulfate is a really, really important sulfated molecule that is in the extracellular matrix of the cells. So um, that deficiency, I think, is really a, a key feature of autism. Um, and sulfate, again, is difficult. Sulfate is difficult to synthesize, difficult to transport, difficult to deliver in the context of glyphosate. It messes it up every which way. Right. Um... Wow, it's been it's been amazing. Uh, thank you very much for for this fascinating talk, Dr. Stephanie Seneff. Um, I will now go on and and um, translate this uh, into into the German language for our audience. That would be wonderful. Thank you. That's I know that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we will get it done, and and that's uh, that's uh, how how uh, I can. Um, contribute uh, to raising awareness uh, over here. Of course, Germany is in many ways is um, um, is, is a different culture. Uh, it has its pros, it has its cons. The uh, the general knowledge about um, um, uh, holistic health, um, about micronutrients, um, mainly um, comes from from the United States um, to us. And, and so we have to do a lot of translation and, and getting into our awareness and our, and our culture. Um, so your talk has been um, very, very helpful in this. We look forward um, to um, following your, your, your work. Any, anything particular on your, uh, on your list? Are you going to write a book or, or something? <laughs> yes, I, I really hope someday I will write a book. It, it, it's going to come to that point, I think, eventually. Um, I'm still struggling with publishing papers, and, I, and I'm actually very much, uh, it's very difficult for me to publish papers in anything other than, you know, sort of, I appreciate the open access uh, movement because I think that is a way for people to get their research out, even though the, they're basically being blocked. I mean, I think that's what's going on with me. My papers get sent back without review. So I think I'm on a, on a list that I cannot publish in the mainstream journals. And that's certainly why I don't. Yeah. Um, it's very frustrating to me that they have this power to basically uh, blacklist. I think it has to be the case that I'm blacklisted pretty much everywhere, you know. But there are open access journals that are willing to publish my work and then you have mechanisms to get them out and it's, because it's open access you don't have to pay 40 bucks for the paper so that's good um, people can read them if they choose to and they can decide whether they think I'm you know uh, I know what I'm talking about or not they'll have to just decide that but I certainly believe I do and I mean I really am very convinced that I'm right this is why I'm so careful not to eat the poisonous food really hoping I myself will avoid Alzheimer's because I think it's going to be difficult to do in this country where the, where the glyphosate is everywhere. It's in the air, it's in the water, it's in, by the way, the, it's probably in the drugs, you know, it's in the vaccines, it's just everywhere. It's in the cotton products, it's in the tampons, it's in the sterile cotton gauze, you know, it's just everywhere. And so it's not something you can avoid if you live in the United States, you simply cannot. Yeah. Or yeah. the more reason to be uh, watchful and to be alert um, on on this risk. And thanks again for for this fascinating talk, Dr. Stephanie Seneff. All the best. Thank to you. Bye bye. Bye bye.